Chris, you were able to forward out the email to the public, right? Yes, I did. All right. All right. So I'll finish up team side. Thank you. Okay. Yvette, did you hear back from them at all? I did just. I've been, I've been in communication with Joe. Right. He's definitely planning to join, but yeah, maybe he has the wrong way. Um, just looking at that. Yeah, I don't think they have anything. Rabbi, can we speak? Uh, can we skip uh, what's it called? The presentation from the. 100%. Maybe go to the next. Yeah. yeah. yeah let's go to the next. Per I mean, yeah. where is going to be the next presentation? I think it's Gun Hill. Yeah. DOT? Yeah. Hi. Okay. Thank you. Just so you know. Oh, good. Hey, everybody. Keith Kalb, uh, interim Bronx Borough Commissioner, Bronx DOT. Thank you for making time for us tonight. I have Holly Malone, our Green Wave Coordinator, who's joining us, and we are waiting for the project manager who is having technical difficulties. She is trying to log in right now. Uh, but we also have Senna Phillips with uh, MTA, who's going to who's going to be joining us during this presentation. Uh, I don't see Sarah joining yet. Um, you, you know, you guys are familiar with this project. We have a better bus plan for Gun Hill Road. Uh, we've been doing the rounds, going to the community boards, reaching out to the stakeholders. We've had a couple of community meetings. We have some improvements that we are looking to make on the East Gun Hill Road corridor between Bainbridge and Bartow Avenue. Uh, we're looking to do that project this season, and we're going to have Sarah Fellow, who just joined us. She is going to share her screen. Welcome, Sarah. I just gave a brief uh, overview of what uh, the project is. You guys are familiar because you've you've seen this. this is not the first time you've heard this. Uh, Sarah, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Show us the update. I can't hear you. I think you're muted, Sarah. Oh, no, you're not muted, but we can't hear you. Sure, okay. no problem. As Sarah tries to figure out her technical, technological issues, I have prepared a little number for everybody this evening. Just kidding. I'm <laughs> tone deaf. Aww. Tone deaf. Uh, sorry for the delay. Seems like everybody's having some difficulties tonight. Rabbi, just an FYI, the issue that we spoke about this uh, this afternoon will be resolved shortly. Thank you. Thanks for your patience on that. Uh, just to recap, we you know we we're in the process of doing the community advisory boards for the East Gun Hill corridor, um, and we have been updating all the stakeholders, and we are about to have the third. Uh, stakeholder uh, CAB meeting uh, in August. I'm probably getting that date wrong. August 26th? Maybe? I don't know. These guys will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and this is the, we're going to show you the proposal, the the proposal for this, for this roadway in just a minute. No. No. Sorry, I cannot hear you. Bye bye, Sarah. Give Sarah a raise. Oh. Poor Sarah, she's turning white. Oh. <laughs> she's not. She's a trooper. We had, we had a, me and uh, Holly were at another site and we had to call Sarah for uh, some text and technical advice, advisement. So we, we knew she was coming uh, this afternoon or this evening. Uh, so we had just spoken to her a couple hours ago. So it wasn't, we weren't expecting technical difficulties though. Okay, start to sing, Keith. You don't want to hear me sing, trust me. You don't want Do to hear me sing. you want to log off, Sarah, and try again? I sent you another link. Okay, go ahead. 
Uh, no. Anything else you'd like to talk about with the Department of Transportation while we have a few minutes, while we try and figure this out? And, and we do have Joe O'Donnell, you guys, so if you want to go to the oh. MTA, we can do that briefly. And... Would anybody could have... Yeah, okay, MTA. let's Good let's idea. switch let's switch to MTA. Come on. Okay, MTA, thanks. Let, let the man, MTA go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so floor is ours, I guess. <laughs> thanks, everybody. Um, thanks for having us here tonight. Um, I think this was a reschedule from earlier on. So uh, thanks for getting us in. Um, my name is Joe O'Donnell. I'm the director of government and community relations for MTA Construction and Development. Uh, we are the arm of the MTA that will be advancing the Penn Station Access Program. Uh, I see we also have Tom McGinnis, the project CEO, finally got in. Hey, Tom, how are you? Um, don't feel bad, Tom. A lot of folks are having technical difficulties tonight. So it's one of those uh, mercury and retrograde events, I think. Um, but anyway, I was just uh, introducing myself and the project. Uh, we're here to speak to you tonight about the Penn Station Access Project. Um, which, as you are all probably, <clears throat> excuse me, likely familiar, uh, will bring four new accessible stations uh, to the East Bronx uh, for Metro North service. Um, we've been to you uh, several times in the past, largely prior to COVID. Um, we are excited about the fact that even in the downturn over COVID, we are able to keep this project moving in advance, the design and preliminary engineering of this project. Uh, we actually got it to be uh, to the point of being awarded in December of 2021, uh, and the contractor was giving not given notice to proceed uh, in January of 2022. Um, so things are are getting more active. Um, the contractor is fast at work, um, confirming our preliminary design and advancing the design, um, doing test pits and borings to make sure that what we believe to be under the surface here along the right of way and adjacent to the right of way is in fact uh, what it is. We've learned as a best practice from other projects to dot our I's and cross our T's because some of these drawings are 100 years old, not necessarily up kept um, despite the best coordination and interaction with our intercity partners uh, and, and other agencies. Sometimes the documents are wrong, so it prevents curveballs. Uh, and mishaps and delays when we when we get out there and find things are, aren't the same as what we have on the drawing. So we're doing that now. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and walk you through a bit of a presentation. What it'll do is it'll give you an overview of what the project is for some of you who may not have seen this in the past or you know um, are not familiar with me or the project. So it'll level set for everybody so that we're all speaking the same language. Uh, then it'll give you a little bit of an update as to where we are right now in the project's life cycle. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about 22, 23 and beyond. Um, so bear with me one second while I share my screen. Can everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so, essentially, uh, again, from a level setting standpoint, what is the Penn Station Access Project? Uh, this project will provide new Metro North rail service to and from Penn Station. It's going to bring Amtrak's existing Hellgate line into a state of good repair, uh, improving reliability and on-time performance for intercity rail. It's going to construct four new ADA accessible stations for Metro North in the East Bronx, which is an underserved area. And it's going to transform our regional transportation system by improving reliability, reducing travel time, and expanding mass transit options. Uh, this will bolster equity and regional connectivity by delivering an entirely new transit option. Uh, as I mentioned, there are going to be four new stations. Uh, these stations will be on Metro North's New Haven line. Uh, they will be located at Co-op City, <clears throat> Morris Park, Parkchester Van Ness, and Hunts Point. Uh, I mentioned that they will travel in on the New Haven line uh, before crossing over the Hellgate Bridge onto the Hellgate line and then ultimately into Penn Station. Uh, I mentioned that this project um, will bring Amtrak's existing system 
uh, into a state of good repair. There are a lot of elements that go along with this project above and beyond just the four stations. Uh, the four stations are sort of the shiny baubles, uh, and obviously the equity elements of this project that will help Bronxites get not only to Manhattan's west side central business district, but open up reverse commuting from points north and south to the Bronx, um, and then also allow Bronxites to get to points north uh, job centers like uh, White Plains uh, and Stanford, Connecticut. Um, so along with the stations, there will be um, over 19 miles of new and rehabilitated track. Uh, there were four bridge rehabilitations or replacements as part of this project, four new and one reconfigured interlocking. Uh, we're gonna reconfigure the new Rochelle yard, which presently exists, but we're gonna expand that um, so that uh, not only will it be a maintenance uh, stop right now, but it'll also be a jump off point for this new service uh, when it's up and running, uh, as well as for crews to start um, start their day and start and end their day. Um, and then we're gonna modernize the signal power and communications infrastructure here. Um, part of that infrastructure are the interlockings. Uh, you'll hear a lot tonight about the legged interlocking, which is where we are first really gonna be getting uh, work underway. Uh, the legged interlocking is a critical piece of infrastructure for us uh, because what that does is you know, trains, unlike cars or trucks uh, or even buses, can't just turn on a dime. Uh, they need to be switched from one track to another. So we need to upgrade Leggett, uh, which is at the southern portion of the line, the alignment, so that we can move Amtrak trains uh, to other tracks to allow us to safely uh, do the work that we need to do to advance this project. Some of the project benefits. Um, I mentioned decreased travel times. This is going to improve access to underserved neighborhoods. It's going to get you to your destination faster. Um, it's uh, going to create economic vitality, both in the long term and the short term. In the short term, there's going to be capital and dollars infused into these um, the, the areas of the East Bronx based on workers coming in and out of there every day. Um, who will frequent frequent shops and restaurants. And then in the long term, I mentioned not only the ability for Bronx sites to get to job centers, but vital job centers like Morris Park, Einstein, Montefiore, Hutch Metro Center, Mercy College. Um, these areas are now going to be more attractive to world-class talent because of the fact that they're much more accessible. Um, this project is going to bridge communities. It's going to literally and figuratively bridge communities. I mentioned on the previous slide, some of the bridges that we're going to uh, reconfigure, uh, but it's also gonna bridge communities like Morris Park and Parkchester Van Nest, where the uh, train tracks bisected the community. And, and in some cases you would need to go out of your way, you know, upwards of a mile to get to the other side of the tracks at some point. Um, from a sustainability standpoint, this project is gonna encourage drivers to switch to train travel, creating a one seat ride, uh, reducing train uh, or traffic congestion and improving air quality. Um, I mentioned the reverse commuting opportunities here, not only to get folks from the Bronx where they need to go, but to attract new talent into the Bronx. Um, we're gonna be optimizing existing infrastructure. The vast major majority of this project, save for some circulation elements and some landing points for our station areas, are largely going to be constructed within the existing infrastructure, Amtrak infrastructure. Um, so we're gonna be taking a two track system and converting it into a four track system, all within that Amtrak right of way. Uh, it's going to in, uh, increase regional transportation connectivity by expanding your travel opportunities. Now you're going to be able to take a train in one seat ride into Penn Station. You're going to be able to connect to Amtrak, uh, the PATH, New York City Transit, buses, Long Island Railroad. Um, and then it's going to enhance network reliability. It's going to provide flexibility for Metro North by improve and improve on time performance for intercity passengers. Right now, Metro North's singular point of failure, it's only lifeline into and out of Manhattan uh, is through the Park Avenue viaduct and 125th Street into Grand Central. This is going to provide a secondary lifeline into Manhattan. And if anybody who's familiar with some of our more recent super storms or the Park Avenue viaduct fire in 2016, uh, that th those events all but cut off Metro North service into and out of the city, this will provide much more flexibility and allow Amtrak um, to nimbly recover from other, uh, other issues. From a project status standpoint, I mentioned 
this project was awarded uh, in December of 2021. It is a design build contract. It is a joint venture of Helmar International LLC and Railworks. They were given their notice to proceed in January uh, of 2022. And the anticipated completion date for the Penn Station access project as a whole, and I'll get into that in a minute, but as a whole, the entire project revenue service is anticipated for um, 2027. Each of the station elements and some of those um, infrastructure elements that I, I, I highlighted for you a moment or two ago, uh, they're all going to have their own schedules. And we'll talk a little bit about that specifically in the context of Park Test of Van Ness and Morris Park, because those are the uh, station areas that you're most concerned with or this, this committee is most concerned with right now. Um, but the the intent there is to allow the project team the flexibility um, to switch. If, you know, uh, You know, they can advance some work or push other work off as needed. Um, you know, many of you have heard or possibly dealing with based on your own livelihoods with some supply chain issues. So if we were to run into an issue uh, with rail or concrete or steel or, or whatever the case may be, uh, we have the flexibility based on these independent schedules um, to resequence work so that we can keep it on track, literally and figuratively pun intended for 2027. Uh, the Morris Park Station, this is a conceptual site plan. Um, it is largely going to be where we see it on Bassett Avenue. Um, you know, it could shift a few feet to the north or to the south, but this is uh, largely where the, the station is anticipated to be for Morris Park. There will be a north entrance on Bassett Avenue, the public Bassett Avenue. Um, there will be a center platform, and then there will be a south entrance um, on Bassett Avenue, the, the private Bassett Avenue. Um, this landing area is going to come down uh, in the area, the vicinity right now of the memorial uh, at the Residence Inn, uh, the Marriott Residence Inn. Uh, we were just there, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but we were just there last week hosting a jobs event um, associated with this project where we brought together um, 18 uh, union apprenticeship programs, early entry and direct entry apprenticeship programs, uh, MTAs, uh, recruitment and talent engagement uh, team, as well as FDNY. Um, and then those two groups were there to talk about civil service opportunities and opportunities with the MTA. Um, we have largely uh, on federally funded projects been handcuffed by the fact that the FTA precludes us or has historically precluded the MTA or anybody with a federally funded project for that matter um, from geographically re, um, restricting the contractors hiring practices. So what that means is I could not tell or Tom really because he's the project CEO, um, but Tom could not tell the contractor previously that you need to hire X amount of individuals from this community where we're delivering this project because uh, we would be in jeopardy of losing our federal funding. So what we've tried to do is to um, work around that by making marriages between job seekers and folks who are looking uh, for those entry level, middle income uh, jobs, pathways to uh, apprenticeship programs uh, by, by having holding these jobs events in areas where we are delivering these capital projects. And we had a very successful program uh, event on the 7th of June where we had over 200 um, in fact, I think it was 220 job seekers came out uh, and visited us and circulated um, that event, but I'll, I'll show some photos from that in a little bit. Um, also, as I know, for this community board uh, of interest is the Park Chester Van Nest station. So the conceptual design uh, here is on East Tremont Avenue, uh, directly across the street um, from the uh, Park Chester condominium uh, and apartments. Uh, there is also a secondary entrance uh, that was added to this project off of Unionport Road and the bridge there. Um, so again, it is going to be um, a main entrance right across the street on Tremont Avenue from the from the apartment complex there. Um, and then if you see here to the left of the screen or to the left of this circle, um, a, a secondary entrance uh, for Parkchester Van Nest. Um, what to expect in 2022? Now that we've got the contractor on board, as I mentioned, they're advancing design. Uh, dotting I's and crossing T's, uh, but they're going to be developing a detailed design package. They're do doing that site survey work and subsurface investigations, utility identification, 
um, they're procuring long lead items. Not only um, are we cognizant of those those supply chain issues, but there are certain elements that we already know, absent all of those supply chain elements, that take longer to secure than others and procure. Um, so so we're starting those long lead items now to to um, to get those on order and get those going. Um, the geotech borings I mentioned this are part of that subsurface investigation. A lot of that's going on around bridges uh, for the stations and for the substations. There is some site mobilization um, with um, some lay down areas and field trailers that you might see uh, in the area. We're doing a lot of clearing and utility relocation uh, along the access roads uh, in order to get to the right of way and along the right of way so that we can do what we need to do. Um, there will be the creation and uh, construction of some retaining walls, um, overhead catenary uh, foundations, and those are the power lines that will power the trains, um, and then site grading um, along the right of way, because again, we're expanding what is presently a two track system into a four track system. Um, I mentioned the early focus at Leggett, but we'll also be concentrating quite a bit at Hunts Point, because again, um, it's at the southern. Uh, section of that uh, uh, project alignment. Um, and then we'll also, along with the job event that we just hold uh, held, we're going to be back in Morris Park again at the um, Marriott residence in there to hold a public hearing um, on the eminent domain process on June the 22nd. Again, more information on that to follow uh, later on in this presentation with all the details. Um, but there we'll be discussing some of the property needs uh, uh, for this project and, and some of the impacts. Um, the Hunts Point and Parkchester Van Ness stations are the first two to get going, and those are anticipated to see work starting on the stations or those the, the shinier baubles of the, of the project uh, in 2023. This is an overall project timeline with each of the elements broken out. So as you can see here, uh, middle of 22, we're getting underway with that legged interlocking work that I mentioned. That's going to take us all the way out to the middle of 24. Um, shortly after that, in in the in 23, uh, first quarter to second quarter of 2023, we're going to get going on a lot of the bridge work, Pelham Lane Bridge, Bronxdale Avenue Bridge, and the East Chester Road Bridge. Um, power substations, the first one to get going there will be in Co-op City, uh, and that's mid-23. And then uh, I mentioned the passenger stations. Uh, the first one to get going will be Hunts Point uh, in late 23 uh, and just uh, towards the end of 23, Parkchester Van Nest with Forest Park and Co-op City uh, to follow later on in 2025. The track systems, um, overhead catenary system and communications, uh, that's going to get going in 23 and then take us right on out to revenue service when trains begin to run. Um, here are some photos, a couple of photos from the job information event. Um, it was held at the atrium at the residence in. Um, again, you uh, we have our on the right hand side of the screen here. We have our project team, and in farther in the distance on the right hand side there, the woman uh, with the auburn hair. Hair. She's from uh, from our MTA talent and recruitment uh, department uh, team. Um, so these are some folks that were interested in not only the project, but some opportunities with the MTA, and then on the left. Uh, it was sort of a U shape, so you could see folks milling about here um, and and frequenting some of the tables. Uh, as as I mentioned, they, we partnered with the Building and Construction Trades Council of Greater New York, and they brought out 18 of their um, affiliates who have direct entry or early entry apprenticeship programs uh, to talk to folks about how they could get involved in those apprenticeship programs. Um, we have long thought that if we could make a marriage between folks who are looking for employment opportunities uh, and some of these uh, middle income jobs, then it's a win win for all of us. Uh, and even if they ever don't get through the um, apprenticeship program, because sometimes depending on the type of trade that you're interested in, these can take three or four years to get through an apprenticeship. Um, so they may not make it through the program in order to actually work on this project, uh, but it would be a home run. Uh, if they were ever able to get through that that pipeline and then be able to say that they worked on this on this project in their own backyard. But our first and foremost focus is to really marry folks uh, with the opportunities, get them the information uh, for the opportunities that are out there so um, that they can find pathways into those those middle income jobs. I mentioned the eminent domain um, hearing. This is going to be a hybrid hearing, so we will have an in person. Uh, portion or uh, portion section of the program uh, that will be also at the atrium. 
um, on East Chester Road in the Bronx. Um, but if you don't want to come out in person or it's easier um, to log on, you can log on via Zoom. Um, speaker registration closes at 6.30 p.m. on that night, but um, you can log on and, and register all the way up until that point if you wanted to uh, register to make a comment. Um, for a full list of the impacted properties, how to register for speaking uh, and the Zoom information itself, you know, we ask you please visit the website, which is um, new m new.mta.info slash pen hyphen access hyphen hearing. Um, and then you can get all of the information there. Uh, we'll provide the community board with this presentation after the fact. So you all will have this and you can post this to your website as well. Um, the community board stakeholders, elected officials all also received notification. So um, the community board should have all of this information already. Um, specific to the property acquisition um, and, and specifically to Parkchester, Van Ness, the uh, the the property, uh, the main property, or the 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 one major acquisition that we are looking to advance as part of that eminent domain process um, would be a full full um, property taking is uh, on East. Oh, that's the uh, uh, Parkchester Tremont Parking Corporation. Uh, that's located directly across the street. Uh, from the uh, the Parkchester uh, condominium complex, as I mentioned, you can see in the blue where the station footprint is going to be and the station entrance on East Tremont Avenue. So just to the right of that uh, is the parking lot uh, that the, the parking corp. So we are already in discussion. There's already some communications with the owners of those of that parcel uh, and the components within that those parcels um, to advance discussions. Uh, about the acquisition of those parcels. Um, not only will we need that for the construction of the station, um, but also for some of the power and substation components uh, as we get further along in the project. Also, as part of this uh, community board or within the, the footprint of this community board is a second parcel, uh, and that is for uh, UCP, United Cerebral Palsy, on Stillwell Avenue. Um, and that is for a small parcel uh, I believe it's 120 square feet or thereabouts, and that's largely uh, for the siting of one of the overhead catenary poles uh, for the power that I, that I mentioned earlier. Um, so those two are the most uh, critical or the two that I think are the most relevant uh, to this community board. Um, for construction related inquiries, there are dedicated hotlines and emails. I mentioned or I point out that these are for inquiries. If there's questions or comments, about the project or you want to sign up uh, for e-blasts or notifications about changes in work or any of the events and things that we'll be doing associated with this project, then by all means, I suggest that you reach out to this hotline or to this email. Um, if it is something critical or, or uh, urgent or, God forbid, life-threatening, uh, I would say first call, contact 911, uh, but secondarily, you can get a hold of myself. Well, I'm also joined on the call tonight by Molly Hollister, uh, and Yvette Klein Kleinbach that I know of. I'm sure there are a couple other folks on that I, I didn't see in the um, in the drop down. But we also have members of our communications team here who are um, you know in contact with the community board, so you have their community inf or, or their contact information. Um, you know, it may not always be myself reaching out to you directly. Uh, it may be the folks from our comms team. Um, so I'd love you to be familiar with them as well. Um, I mentioned the project webpage. And then also, as I mentioned, to sign up for future updates, um, once you go onto that website, you can either email us directly at that PSA outreach and say, hey, I'd love to be included in future notifications and updates, but you can also go, there's a form that you can actually go on the website um, and fill out in order to be added to any distribution lists. I believe that's it, although it's not advancing right now. It gets a little finicky, it seems. Thank you. <laughs> so um, with that, I turn it back over to the chair. Um, happy to entertain questions. Hey, Harvey, the, um, we also have members of the, the, team, hour to me the later. comms team to take any questions. Um, up to you if you'd like me to take down the presentation or leave it up so that we could toggle back and forth between some of the information. So you mentioned uh, 1770 Stowell. 
Uh, yeah. What what exactly are you doing with the with part of that parcel land? So that is the that is the UCP or United Cerebral Palsy NYC's property. It's a huge, huge parcel there, and we're we're yes, I'm familiar with that. That's why I'm yeah. asking. Yeah, we're only looking. We're in uh, conversation, or we'll be in conversation with them for a small parcel to site an overhead catenary pole, the power pole. How many? How many power poles are you looking to do? One. Just one two. there, yeah, just one. Okay, thank you. So, so my question, question is, Jared, I, I think I'm getting echoes. echoes. Could you? Uh, I'm I'm twice. twice. I'm gonna I'm gonna mute myself in case. Actually, Moish, I think you're on like three times. Okay, so knock me off twice. <clears throat> okay, excuse me. So my question is, are you thinking of having like a bus service like you have in Riverdale, where you can transport people to the stations? So the, the thought process is right now is there there is no parking that is um, – that is, uh, there's no component parking structure, or com parking components as part of this project scope. Um, we are working with Department of City Planning in the city. Um, they had an entire visioning series leading up uh, to, well, prior to COVID, but leading up to, you know, the advancement of this project uh, where we met with the communities. We were part of DCP's planning efforts or visioning efforts. Um, and they've largely, they are largely in charge of sort of that first mile, last mile. Um, as you all well know too, department, uh, I mean, uh, our bus department uh, is in the process of a, a reimagining of the bus services. Um, so the, the contemplation is that there would be, there or there could be some shuttles or additional bus service to get people there. Um, you know, the anticipation, at least for the Parkchester Van Ness station and the Morris Park stations are, that the vast majority of the users are going to be working or living right around those station areas, so they won't be traveling from too far away for to use those stations. Okay, so I could just speak for the Pelham Parkway area. How are those people going to get to the bus? How to get to the station? For Co-op City? No, for Morris Park. I mean, Pelham Parkway, which is a pretty densely populated area to get to the Morris Park station is they gonna would, have it's not a they'll walk. have to take the tw yeah, they would have to take the twelve to the thirty one to the Metro North. I mean, you could look at it on a map. It is definitely not a walk. And like I think Debbie said, it might be a two bus trip to get to the station. Yeah, I will double check what the uh, the bus options are for getting to that station. Um, it's either I forgot what the number is that's on East Chester Road. It's either twenty one or thirty one, but yes, it would be the twelve to the one that runs on East Chester Road. Or if somebody wanted to walk over to Morris Park and then catch that bus, if they wanted to do just one bus. But yeah, it's it's not not. That easy, you know, it's not fully thought out. Let me ask you the bus service that runs in Riverdale. I forgot what the name it is, Link or something like that. Who is that funded by? Uh, not familiar, unfortunately, with the bus service. So um, I, I, I don't know. Um, I have to get back to you on that one. Rabbi, that's Atlantic Express. I don't think it's Atlantic Express. No, it's a little, it's a little, it's a little buses, and it says Metro North on the side, and it says Link. And right, I goes, lived in Riverdale for forty years. Okay, if you say it's Atlantic Express, whatever it is, it goes around uh, the whole community and drops off people and picks up people, so people do not have to take buses or take their cars to the station. Right. There, there are two two separate stations: North Riverdale and South Riverdale. And they have two different routes. Uh, plus, there's parking by the two stations also. Right. Okay. So that would have to be looked into. Now, one more question, and I'll turn it off to anybody else in the committee. I think this is great work you're doing. I think it's historic. It's a milestone. It's a beautiful thing. But we all know to attract people to anything in America 
or in the world, you have to run some discounts up front. And this might be long term, but are you thinking once you open up the gates and open up these beautiful stations that there'll be some discount at least to start off for the local commuters? And then I guess as time goes on, the discount would go bye bye. Well, obviously, as we, you know, we, we have not, or we wouldn't, we're building the, the station and the, the infrastructure here would be Metro North that would set the fares as we get closer to revenue service. And because we don't know what the, that fare arrangement is going to be like five years down the road, you know, it, it would be negligent of me to sort of suggest what the fare system would look like at that point. However, we do know, um, you know, well, the, the thought process is, is or, or the, the, inclination is that folks will some folks will come sing, singularly for the one seat ride and, and not having to deal and, and knowing that they have this point of service to get to Manhattan's west side or two points north you know and that may not be enough for folks some folks who you know don't have as much flexibility with income you know that may be more than whatever the fare is for a subway you know 275 or whatever it is at the time um, so there will be some contemplation of like an Atlantic ticket or a metro ticket that they currently opt on Long Island Railroad, where there's a set fare between, say, Jamaica and um, Atlantic Terminal. So all those options will be considered as we get closer to, to revenue service, but the fare structure will need to be determined as we get closer. Thank you so much. Does yeah. anybody else have any questions from the committee? Because it's already now 8-11, and we still have another presentation to do. Anybody else have any questions? Um, obviously, too, we will provide you, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, with this presentation. And if folks have an opportunity to take a deeper dive in it, we're not going anywhere. You know, Jeremy and, and Al have all my contact information and we speak regularly. So, um, you know, this is just the beginning of an ongoing and sustained dialogue here. So if things come up after the fact, we're always around to answer questions. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, having... so now who are we going back to? Are we Keith? Are we going back to you or I don't know who who's who's our next speaker now because we're like batting out of order now. Can can we, can y'all hear me now? I hear you loud and clear. I am so grateful for that and so appreciative to all of you for your patience tonight and thank you so much Joe for uh cutting ahead in line and and um and getting your presentation that was really uh very much appreciated and I'm ready to present. Okay. It's all Excellent. yours. All right, let me go ahead and share my screen. Let's get this open for you. And can, can you all see this right now? Can someone give me a yes or a no? Can you see my screen? Good, Sarah. So yeah, Excellent. I was nodding, sorry. Yes. <laughs> yes. Excellent, okay, great. Well, thank you so much for your time again. My name is Sarah Feller. I'm on DOT's bus priority team. And tonight is our second presentation to uh, CB11TC about Gun Hill Road bus and pedestrian improvements. So um, the last time I was, uh, or I and we um, were at this board, we're back in April, uh, where we kind of talked through the existing conditions on Gun Hill Road, why it's such an important street uh, to invest in making bus service better and in making the street safer. Um, and we had a bit of a conversation about, you know, um, what you all need this corridor to do and what you expect from this project and, and how we can make, you know, how we can work together to make this street work better. So we've taken that feedback as well as feedback from CB7, CB12, um, from the CAB, which is the Community Advisory Board of Neighborhood Stakeholders, um, as well as some on-street outreach that we did um, that I'll talk about. And, um, and tonight I'll be showing a, a preliminary draft proposal um, of what we can do on Gun Hill. So it's detailed, it's block by block. Um, I really wanna emphasize it is just a draft and we are you know, looking to get your feedback tonight your thoughts, what makes sense, what might not make sense, um, and so we can refine uh, that that proposal. So uh, I've already, you know, we've already gone through the existing conditions, um, but I will say very quickly that um, that you know, Gun Hill Road is a major east to west corridor for all modes of transportation. Um, it carries five bus routes that total forty thousand people a day, which is just almost an unfathomable number of people. Um, filling up these buses uh, during the day, during the night, all times of day, all days of the week. Um, it's a really critical connector um, that serves several subway lines, Montefiore, Bay Plaza Mall, Co-op City, and all the neighborhoods and businesses in between. Um, 
And as a result, uh, MTA and DOT listed it as one of 10 key locations um, to invest in bus priority. Senna, do you want to speak to, uh, to bus speeds on Gun Hill really quickly? Sure thing, Sarah. So some of you might recall these slides from our last meeting, um, but I just want to give you all a quick reminder um, on some of the data, which highlights kind of how traffic conditions on Gun Hill Road impact our bus service. So the BX28 and 38, generally we see it moving pretty slow all day with speeds of less than seven miles per hour. Um, unfortunately, during those critical peak service hours when folks are maybe trying to get to work or pick up kids from school, you know, typically when folks are depending on high quality transit the most, um, you know, we're, we're seeing speeds dip uh, below five miles per hour. Um, and when we compare that that speed to overnight travel times, we, we see that during those peak periods, people are spending about 15 to 17 minutes uh, additionally traveling for that full length of the corridor during those those slow down times. And that's something that really adds up if you're someone who uses this corridor every day, you know, like that's. 15 minutes or, or 30 minutes, depending on, on how often you're riding this bus, it, it really adds up. Sorry, you can go to the next slide. And this will just uh, give you all a quick sense of how the Gun Hill Road routes compared to other Bronx bus routes. You know, we can see route level bus speeds here, and we can see that, you know, the BX28 uh, speeds are especially underperforming when we compare them to those Bronx borough wide averages. Um, which this kind of just generally emphasizes the need for some sort of traffic intervention on this corridor. Um, I also just want to take a moment and highlight the speed gains that we saw during uh, April 2020 of the pandemic. You know, you can see speeds kind of jumping right there. Um, unfortunately, as, as you know, traffic has returned to the street and, you know, also as ridership has returned, we have seen our bus speeds decrease back to pre-pandemic levels. Um, kind of one main goal of this project really is to regain as much of those those pandemic speed gains that we saw and, and hopefully bring the corridor up up to its most efficient efficient operating level. Thanks, Sarah. Absolutely. Thanks, Anna. Um, we also spoke in the last presentation about the crash, his, the crash history on the street. Um, the quick version of it is that in a five in the most recent five years for which we have data, um, nearly five people every week were injured in crashes on Gun Hill Road. This makes it one of the more dangerous streets in the Bronx. Um, and it, as a result, it was named Division Zero Priority Corridor. Um, and we really need uh, to make this street safer um, for pedestrians, for motorists, for all modes of transportation, because safety issue, the injuries, the severe injuries were for all modes of transportation um, as well. And we have opportunities to, to make this street safer as well. Um, Additionally, we recently held public outreach pop ups on Gun Hill Road, uh, where we had conversations with over 100 bus riders. And the way this works is so uh, DOT, um, we show up at uh, at a busy location um, on the corridor. We set up shop with our with our table and our tent um, and and we encourage folks to talk to us. We give them a, a small gift uh, for their time and appreciation for their input. Um, and so we spent 3 days uh, on Gun Hill Road in May. Um, one of them was in CB7 next to Montefiore. Uh, another location was at Gun Hill and White Plains by the two train. And then a third location was in CB11 at Gun Hill and Knapp Street by the five train on the Dyer Avenue line. Um, and so this was just a couple of weeks ago. So we're still um, kind of crunching this data um, and, and summarizing the feedback that we got. But overall, when you look at it, the, the requests we had were for faster service, um, bus service that is more frequent and more consistent. Um, that includes uh, that includes um, you know a reduction in bus bunching where two buses arrive at a time or three buses arrive at a time and one bus is really crowded the one behind it's very empty um, crowding in particular was was an issue that we heard a lot about and you know bus lanes which we are proposing um, can help to address all of these um, by making bus service not just faster but also more reliable um, so uh, so it takes a more even amount of time to get from one side of the corridor to the other um, and more predictable. Um, and that can help reduce bus bunching and really can improve bus service in a whole bunch of different ways to make it easier and faster and more on schedule for the folks who rely on it. Um, summarizing our goals and our challenges, you know, we wanna make bus service fast, reliable, and on time. We want to reduce crashes, injuries, and fatalities on Gun Hill Road. Um, and we want to organize traffic movements to prevent 
things like double parking uh, that turn Gun Hill Road from a two lane road into a one lane road, for example. Um, obviously, we are dealing with challenges like congestion, um, as well as a, a broken up street grid where there's not a lot of alternate routes, especially if you're trying to get around the Bronx River Parkway. You know, uh, every street's really different and Gun Hill Road is, is no different from that. We have to look at not just looking at Gun Hill specifically to make sure that what we're doing is, is customized. Um, it's not a one size fits all solution because there's no such thing as a one size fits all solution for a New York City street. Um, but also looking at it block by block and even looking at, you know, the, the east side of a, of, of a block versus the west side of the same block. We really have to spend time on the corridor and making sure that what we're proposing is actually going to work. Um, that's one of the biggest challenges here. And so we're really trying to be aware of what Gun Hill Road is like all different times of day, different days of the week, um, uh, you know, block A versus block B versus block C, um, you know, that, that's, our, that's our process here. So going into the draft proposal, and I'll show it to you block by block, um, but basically in CB11 from Boston Road to Bartow Avenue, what we're proposing is offset bus lanes in both directions and an offset bus lane means that we keep the parking um, and the bus lane is the rightmost travel lane next to the parking lane for the most part. <clears throat> um, uh, we're also looking at pedestrian safety improvements at about 15 intersections, maybe a little bit more than 15, depending on how you count it. Um, we're also looking at some changes to curb regulations um, in order to help prevent the need for folks to double park. Um, make sure that when somebody pulls up that there's a space for them so they can park on the block they need to park at, um, do what they need to do, access that business, access that residence without having to block traffic and risk a ticket, which is, you know, we kind of see that as a lose-lose. So looking to improve curb regulations as well as potentially we might need to restrict some left turns. Um, we're still working through those details, um, but you will hear more from us in regards to that um, in the future. But in terms of the overall design, you know, here's what it looks like. And again, I'll show it to you block by block. There's a few different slides. Um, there's a lot of detail here. I am more than happy after the presentation to go through block by block, um, go back to any slide, explain anything in more detail. I really wanna make sure that I'm presenting this in a way that makes sense, um, but I also wanna be mindful of everyone's time. So um, so let me know at the end if, if we need to go back. But um, the offset bus lane, you see, and you all can see my cursor here, right? So uh, the offset bus lane is what you see here, for example, um, uh, towards the north curb in this part of the corridor. Um, so you have the parking, you have the bus lane, and then you have one travel lane for other vehicles. Now, of course, any vehicle can use any bus lane at any time to make the next right turn, to access a driveway. Um, you can also always stop in a bus lane to pick somebody up, drop somebody off. You just need to do so expeditiously can't just sit in the bus lane, but um, you know, the bus lanes benefit uh, not just bus passengers, but also vehicles and they can, they can help to improve traffic flow um, by creating the right turn bay and the other functions. Additionally, bus lanes, of course, can be used by first responders. Um, so that's another really big benefit as well. Um, you also see here some left turn bays. So at major intersections, we did create new left turn bays. Um, you see them here on uh, uh, heading onto Boston Road, both the eastbound left, left turn and the westbound left turn. Um, now, in order to make room for that extra lane for the left turn bay, what we did for a few blocks here is the eastbound bus lane, which you see here along the south curb. Um, we we shifted it uh, for a few blocks from the offset lane to the curbside lane. So here, between Yates Avenue and Boston Road, for example, this is where the BP station is, with like a KFC and a car dealership across the street. Um, so here in front of the gas station, we, we made this, uh, this lane a curbside lane. Um, one thing we wanted to make sure about with this project is we know parking always comes at a premium. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that, you know, we're balancing that, that, you know, it, sometimes you have to make trade-offs on a narrow, busy New York City street that serves a lot of different purposes. Um, but in front of the gas station, for example, it's mostly driveways. There's only a couple, a uh, couple parking spots there. Um, and so that's, you know, we're trying to make these trade-offs as smartly as we can. So, um, so this is what the bus lane looks like. Um, you can see that um, just past Boston Road, between Boston Road and Tenbroke, um, just before the McDonald's, uh, the bus lane goes back into the offset lane to restore that parking. Um, 
one other thing you'll see here, uh, this kind of diamond shaped pedestrian space um, between Boston Road and Herring Avenue. Um, and one, one request that we got uh, going to the community boards in April was to improve uh, pedestrian safety specifically at this intersection of Gun Hill and Boston. Um, and so we added this and what this does is it, it improves visibility between pedestrians and, uh, and drivers. Um, and it also reduces the crossing distance for pedestrians. So we think that's a big improvement. Um, it is going to be painted in that kind of kind of grayish sidewalk colored paint that you see around the city. Um, it also is going to have um, uh, a, a delineator, like a vertical post at the tip of that diamond um, to make sure that cars stay out of it and that it remains a, protect, a protected pedestrian space. So that's the first couple blocks. Um, now I'll show you some more blocks. So this is from Tembroke Avenue. Um, this is the McDonald's here uh, where I'm pointing to Givan Avenue, Parasol Avenue, the Roop Avenue. Um, and then the second, uh, the second row here is uh, past Book Avenue, Wilson Avenue, Burke and Young Avenues. And I apologize if I'm mispronouncing any of these names, please correct me, I wanna make sure I get those right. Um, the first thing, the first thing you might notice here is a new uh, triangular pedestrian island. Um, so right now, uh, at the corner of Givan, Parasol, and Gun Hill, um, you do have this triangular space, but it's uh, it's just it's just um, it's just lines on the street. It's those diagonal marked lines on the street. There's no actual protection for pedestrians, um, and so we were able to actually put in a brand new pedestrian island in concrete. It's going to be you know real sidewalk. Um, for that for that safety benefit, we're really excited about that. There's also um, this is a, a, a big vacant lot here with a uh, a section of um, with a section of sidewalk that's missing, um, and so we actually were able to with painted pedestrian space fill out this sidewalk area, um, so you can you know uh, so pedestrians have a safe place to walk all the way around this block. Um, you'll also see painted curb extensions here at Wilson Avenue. Um, I'm sure you all, you all are familiar with this big area right now that similarly, it's just diagonal painted lines on the street. Um, the crosswalks end and it just, you're still in the street. Um, that's a real safety concern. We're really excited to be able to, uh, to fix that. We're also gonna repave this, this, uh, this, this shape, this area here in, or, uh, in order to, um, to, to, to make that painted space possible. Um, and to just improve the state of good repair of that corner. Um, additionally, there's a slip lane here. Um, it's already closed. Uh, we're just gonna fill that in, in in paint to make that up to standard. Um, now in terms of the bus lane here, you can see that, let's, let's go from left to right in the eastbound direction. Um, you can see that the bus lane here stops about 100 feet before the intersection. And the reason for that is that, you know, you do have left turns um, onto, onto Gavan here, um, going from eastbound Gun Hill onto northbound Gavan. And um, what this does is it allows, uh, you know, if you want to make that left turn and you need to wait for a gap in opposing traffic, you can do so. You can wait in this lane without blocking cars behind you uh, and without, you know, making anybody, um, you know, use the bus lane. It just creates that extra lane um to to make sure that all the traffic movements are being accommodated um so we do that at a few different intersections we certainly do it here at gavan uh, in the eastbound direction otherwise it's pretty typical um you see the offset bustling with all the parking um preserved um additionally we did add left turn bays onto burke avenue um and in order to fit those turn bays um we did shift the westbound bus lane to the curb right around this intersection at Burke and at Wilson. And after Wilson, it shifts back um, to the offset position. A few more blocks for you. So this is Young Avenue, um, Fish Avenue, Sexton Place, Seymour Avenue. This is where the five train is uh, as well on the Dyer Avenue line, that, that five train station. Um, Dewitt Place, Knapp Street, Fenton Avenue, and AD Avenue. Um, so almost all the way to East Chester Road. Um, again, you see the offset bus lane in both directions. Um, we now, uh, the left turns uh, onto some of the minor streets like Sexton Place, Fish Avenue, Young Avenue. Um, you can still make these left turns. You just do so from the single 
um, from the single travel lane here. Um, you certainly see uh, a lot more um, of the painted pedestrian spaces. So for example, here at Young Avenue, um, you had this very, very wide intersection where you had, first of all, a very long crossing distance for pedestrians. Um, you also had um, a, a very wide turn radius, which means that a vehicle, if you wanna make this right turn from Gun Hill Road heading westbound onto Young Avenue, you can make that turn at 30 you know, plus miles an hour, which gives you less time to see pedestrians or, and for pedestrians to see you. And so what we did is we were using painted space and the vertical, um, the vertical barriers to, um, to, to, to make it more of a standard, you know, 90 degree T-shaped intersection. So that way drivers have to slow down a little bit um, to make that turn at a more normal speed. And that gives pedestrians and drivers more time to see one another. And it also reduces the crossing distance for pedestrians and the amount of time the pedestrians are, are vulnerable in the street. Um, and you see the same thing at Seymour Avenue, at 80 Avenue, at Fenton Avenue, et cetera. Um, let's see what else we have here. Additionally, um, we are proposing to uh, relocate the westbound bus stop that serves the five train. So right now, uh, the bus stops in the westbound direction, um, excuse me. Right now, the bus stops in front of the library, the East Chester Library, here at uh, just past Knapp Street. Now, the majority of folks uh, who, who use this bus stop are going to or from the train. Um, and the way that the stop is designed right now, you have to, you know, if the front of the, if the front of the bus stop is probably near the letter F here, you need to walk all the way back to Knapp Street, um, cross the street diagonally, um, and then cross the street again at DeWitt Place, and then walk all the way to the five trains somewhere over here. Um, that's about 400 foot, uh, 400 feet of walking. That's two blocks long. And so in reality, what you see is people take the most direct route and they'll just cross the street here um, and that's outside the crosswalk um, and that's a safety concern as well. So what we're proposing to do is actually to move the bus stop um, closer to Seymour Avenue. Um, so right about where near, near where the stop bar is, the bus, front of the bus stops can be right around here. And so folks get off the bus, uh, they can cross right here at Seymour Avenue and it cuts that walking time in half and makes it a lot easier and encourages folks to use the crosswalk. Um, so that's one uh, one thing that we're proposing here. I think that's it for these two, uh, for this slide. So next let's look at 80 Avenue, O'Neill Place, East Chester Road here, Arno Avenue, Mickle Avenue, Westervelt and Kingsland. Um, East Chester Road, you see, a, again, a lot of painted pedestrian space um, serving the same purposes, trying to make it, um, you know, to, to improve visibility between drivers and pedestrians, um, to reduce the amount of time and space that where people are in the street and vulnerable. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, you see that all across these blocks. Um, you can see that in the westbound direction from right to left, you do have the offset bus lane going all the way through. The offset bus lane begins uh, between Bartow Avenue and Kingsland Avenue. Um, and in the eastbound direction, the bus lane ends at East Chester Road. And the reason for this is 28 and 38 buses, the buses that use this part of Gun Hill, um, those buses uh, make the left turn onto Bartow. And so this is the last stop before Bartow, uh, before it makes that turn. And so this way, um, the bus accesses the stop and then has a few blocks to get into the left lane. Um, additionally, we added left turn bays at East Chester Road to accommodate those left turns. And then finally, one more slide uh, of worth of proposals. Um, so this is Bartow Avenue, Tymon Avenue, Gunther Avenue, Lodovic, Allerton Avenue, and Gunther Avenue. And it's more of the same painted curb extensions um, at Bartow, at Tymon, um, as well as uh, at both sides of Gunther Avenue and at Lodovic Avenue. Um, one thing we heard in particular um, at, uh, I think it was Community Board 12, maybe it was 11, um, where uh, someone specifically requested that we look at pedestrian safety at Bartow. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we were, we were, we were doing that. Um, so there's the draft proposal. Like I said, I'm very happy to go back and explain anything in more detail and hear your thoughts on what you think of, the, of these ideas. In terms of the process, um, as we mentioned before, 
This comes out of the MTA Bronx Bus Network redesign. We had more than 50 outreach events um, on street, uh, in, in, in stations. We had public open houses. We, we were at every single community board. We also had online outreach. Um, and this comes out of that. Um, you know, folks, folks mentioned that this bus on Gun Hill Road um, needs to be faster and more reliable and work better. Um, we've also done a merchant survey with the Jerome Gun Hill bid. Uh, where we visited every single business on Gun Hill Road, all the way from um, from Bainbridge Avenue to Bartow Avenue. Um, we also uh, conducted field field observations. You know, my team and I have spent a lot of time on Gun Hill in person. Like I said before, different times of day, different days of the week, just getting an understanding of how this street actually works, because every street is different, and honestly, every block is different. Um, we also uh, set up time lapse cameras, and you can see an example of what this looks like here in the bottom right, where we set up cameras that took a photograph every minute, and we left, left them up for a few days. Um, so we can really see in detail, again, all different times of day, different days of the week, what traffic is like, um, what the issues are, how much double parking there is, um, how quickly the busers are moving, um, those kinds of issues where we really want to understand really thoroughly um, and really thoughtfully. Um, and our next steps, so right now, you know, this is our second round of outreach to the community boards and to the community advisory board. Um, we are currently sharing the draft proposal, collecting feedback. Um, our plan is to come back in the summer um, and share uh, with the CAB an updated plan. Um, and ultimately, we're looking to implement this this year, and that's because, you know, we know that there's a lot of improvement to be made. There's a lot of issues right now that are really pressing, especially when it comes to safety. We want to get those in the ground as soon as we can. Um, we want to make sure we're, we're being thorough in, in our outreach and in our design, but uh, you know we, we know these improvements need to take place. So we are looking to implement um, in late summer uh, and into the fall. Um, so there you have it. Thank you so much again for your time, and we're very, very happy to hear your thoughts on this. This is question number one. <coughs> Okay, so I guess it's me because everybody's quiet today, which is good. So out of those 40,000 people that go back and forth, did you break it down by age, school, senior citizen, so on and so forth that are using those buses? Senna, do you want to speak to this? I think. Yeah, so the, that is just our raw ridership data. That is, you know, folks with their Metro cards um, doesn't provide us a whole lot of information. Um, however, we have looked at the corridor, um, looking at kind of a, a geospatial perspective of who's who's living there, who's traveling to, from, et cetera. So while that 40,000 number is just our raw passengers and doesn't include any, any of that demographic data, we have looked at that dem demographic data to, to sort of inform this proposal. Okay, and is there any thought of making one of those buses or two of those buses limited stop buses? Would that help? and make them go a little quicker from point to point? So with the Bronx bus network redesign, which is coming online later this month, um, we have actually kind of consolidated uh, our routing on Gun Hill Road. So the BX30 will be traveling on Boston Road now, and we will only have the BX28 and 38, and then the BX41 um, for just a small segment of the corridor around White Plains Road. Um, but those buses uh, have also received a stop consolidation uh, through the Bronx Bus Network Redesign Plan. So we've we've actually eliminated a few stops, um, kind of tried to to split the difference essentially between a, a slower local service and and a full limited. So hopefully you should see some improvements. But we'd love to stay in touch. And if you are not um, seeing those improvements on the corridor, if, if there still is potential for like a limited stop service, that's definitely something we'd love to hear. And we'd love to hear kind of after our implementation um, on June 26th, I believe. So coming soon. Okay, any other questions from committee? Rabbi, I have a couple of questions. Okay, couple is good. Okay. Will this be a 24 hour bus lane or a 7 p.m. to 7 or uh, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. bus lane? So those details are still being worked out. I think we're looking most likely at a 24 hour bus lane. And that's for a couple of reasons. I mean, for, for an offset bus lane like, like we're proposing here, 
Um, I'll put it to you this way. If it's a curbside bus lane, uh, you know, that that is using space that would otherwise go to parking, then we have a strong incentive to permit parking overnights and on weekends. But, you know, uh, when, when folks aren't, you know, when folks are out of work and, and want to park, you know, want to park overnight. Um, but for a bus lane that's offset, that's in what would otherwise be a travel lane, you know, we if we wanted, we could make this, you know, uh, we we could make it a seven a.m. to seven p.m. Um, but you get you get less benefit uh, for traffic because rush hour is over. Um, it also one other benefit of bus lanes is that it it can help reduce speeding overnight um, because you know late at night or or during other times of the day when traffic is really light, you know, you don't want to have uh, you you know if you have two lanes, you have vehicles can weave. Um, and speed more easily, uh, and but you lose uh, those safety benefits if you if you don't have a, that, that bus lane overnight. So we would be looking to to make this a 24 hour bus lane most likely, um, as most offset bus lanes around the city are. Well, the B12 on Fordham Road and Pelham Parkway has a designated bus lane, but it's only seven to seven, and there is no parking on that. That's I'm just going to mention that for you. Uh, do you plan on building concrete islands at the bus stops? And where would they be if they are? At the bus stops themselves, no. Um, I mentioned there's a couple pieces of concrete that we are looking to put in this year. One of them is here at Givan, draw uh, to to uh, take this um, this triangular area that right now is just diagonal painted lines on the street and actually make this in concrete, um, primarily as a pedestrian safety benefit. Um, otherwise, most of this work is being done in paint because in paint you can make a lot of improvements. And you can do them quickly, and you can really transform a corridor um, in just a in, you know in a in a one year project. That's correct. But if you're looking at passengers coming off and on to the buses, that you sometimes have a big step when they come off, and some people do trip. And if there's traffic that's going to go around the bus in the parking lane, they could get hurt. I hope you would take that into account. Uh, and my final note is, are you you know during your study period? Are you aware that there was major construction at Bainbridge Avenue? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And that I see you don't go through to Jerome where the train is, but again, the bus is turned up on Bainbridge. Uh, and there it was a gas line that Con Edison installed from the Mount Vernon line all the way. It's going all the way down to, uh, uh, what is it, uh, down to Hunts Point. So this construction also delayed your buses. Yes, we're de we're definitely aware of that, and we know it's a pretty big, multi-year, and pretty disruptive project uh, for the area around it. Um, we're also uh, looking to coordinate um, with that project to to coordinate our our construction with theirs and try to minimize you know minimize any any uh, construction related inconveniences. But we're definitely aware. Of that. My my last question is: mm -hmm. You have the same exact design on Webster Avenue. And I know that there's complaints on Webster Avenue, it runs by schools. Uh, Gun Hill Road, you have them off of Gun Hill, not on Gun Hill. Uh, is there any plans to redo Webster Avenue? Um, there's no plans to redo Webster Avenue. I think I do have some, I'll quickly share. We do have some, some you know, results in terms of how that project um, yes. uh, performed. And, uh, you know, it performed pretty darn well. Um, what we saw on Webster with the offset bus lanes, as well as the um, upward fare collection, all the other improvements that come with select bus service. You know, we saw we saw bus travel times go down by about 20% in all different times a day um, and in both directions. So um, if there's any particular concerns that that you have, we're very, very happy to hear them and see if we can accommodate. But on the whole, this project, I think, is has done what it set out to do. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to... I will finalize just with a past question of mine, Sarah. I'm sorry to ask you so many questions, but the fact of life is going east to west uh, on Allerton and on Pelham Parkway. I don't really know, Sarah, if that's much worse than Gun Hill Road or much better than Gun Hill Road. And I think I asked last time, I don't know who said it, they were going to look into it. Is there any thought of looking at those two monstrosities. Pelham Parkway for sure creeps along. And Allerton, Sarah, you're an expert on streets in the Bronx. The way you walk and the way you run, you could beat any bus on Allerton Avenue. They just do not, they don't move, plain and simple. And that's only 
one bus line, only one bus line, the minute it hits White Plains Road, comes to a stop. And then it tries to get in by Southern Boulevard there. Mm -hmm. And again, you could, like I said last time, you could walk and beat the bus. So are there any thoughts in the future of improving the Bronx that you could get from the east to the west side with that out getting jammed up? Certainly. I, I, I totally know what you're talking about. And, you know, there's a there's a ultimately, you know, traffic is widespread in the Bronx and around the city. And we know that our Avenue buses are not as fast as they could and should be or as reliable. Um, you know, we, we do we're able to do a handful of projects a year and we, we try to prioritize the streets that are both the slowest and the busiest. Um, so, you know, Gun Hill, uh, Gun Hill was prioritized for some combination of those reasons, the very high ridership, sheer number of routes that use it, as well as maybe other factors as well. Um, but we're, you know, we're always doing citywide analyses of, of, of which routes to work on next. And we'll certainly continue to look at Allerton Avenue going forward. Um, additionally, um, Pelham Parkway, we are looking at, um, we are starting to uh, look at um, the uh, the Fordham Fordham Road Pelham Parkway uh, corridor. Um, you know that that corridor received um, bus improvements uh, about 15 years ago. Um, we are looking to see if we can improve on that older design because our our designs have changed. We've learned a lot from 15 years of projects, um, and so uh, I'm not involved with that myself. Uh, other people, other folks on my team are. Um, but we are starting to look at at the BX12 in that corridor. Okay. So, Rabbi, we, so we are looking at Fordham Road, as Sarah alluded to. Uh, that project is not as far along as this project. And keep in mind, obviously, the 12, you know, Fordham and Pelham are, you know, are connected. Uh, but, you okay. know, the Department of Design and Construction project on Pelham Parkway is not completed yet. So... Ideally, the Pelham Parkway project, once completed, that has a bike, that has a, sorry, not a bike lane, has a bus lane uh, component on it. And hopefully once that construction is fi finished up at White Plains, at Boston, uh, hopefully some of that traffic will move through those intersections. It's just, Keith, you have so many buses up there on Fordham Road. You have a 12, you have a 12 Limited. You got a Westchester 60, 61, 62, bingo. You got 17 a bus going there. You got yes. a lot of buses up on the top there, Keith. And I don't know how in the world you should live and be well to 120 years old, Keith. But that's going to be a tough one. It and that and that is uh, that is why the we're having similar uh, you know outreach process, much much larger scale, and that's why the the project is um is taking longer because you know we have three community boards uh, uh and multiple multiple bids multiple stakeholders multiple elected officials and we have uh, you know much bigger corridor mu much busier uh corridor uh of fordham road which feeds of course into pelham into pelham parkway uh and so the, it's you know a very 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 complex I know these are all complex, but it's a very, very, very complex, uh, you know, corridor that has a lot of different moving parts. Uh, and so we are looking at it. We're working on it. Um, yeah. Okay. So it's, ha okay. It's, um, it's, it, it's, folks, it's happening. I don't think the city pays these guys overtime. So I want them to try to get home to their families. Does anybody? I'm sorry. I didn't have a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm I didn't say I'm finished. I didn't say, I didn't say I'm finished. They are old. Yeah, I just said that at least we want to have a little consideration for them. So you could pose your questions now, either from the committee or from the public, and let's try to get them out at least by nine o'clock. Thank all right. you. All right. I told you I had a few. So, all right. Here, here goes mine. All right. Um, and this is towards, this is not. It has nothing to do with any of the bus stuff, so it's not the MTA anymore. It's totally for Keith. <laughs> um, I was wondering about on White Plains Road by Van Ness and Mead. There's an area, um, there's a no standing sign pointing one direction and a parking sign pointing to the other. It's only allotting for one car to park when 
you can clearly park four or five cars there. So I was wondering if the no standing sign could be removed because it's there's plenty of parking spots before it's even anything at the uh at the bus stop. Um, Keith, I'll I'll even email you the picture if you wish. So you know exactly Please. what I'm talking about. Please send me the, uh, send me the details. I'm not I. I'm good, but I just don't, I don't know that every, no standing no, yeah, sign yeah. in the Bronx. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 I, 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 I understand that. I, I, I had wanted to be on my laptop so I could try to share screen, but that was not possible today. <laughs> so just send, um, okay. send it through, Next question, through please. Chris or oh, yeah. to, it, to, Jer- to Jeremy and, and we'll take a look at it. I don't, I don't know why okay. it's there. It might, might be for daylighting, but yeah. Just no, 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 it it's not, it's not, it's actually would be an opposite of a daylighting and it's not even daylighting because mead goes in it's not even coming out so it's not even a daylight issue but i will definitely send you the picture uh so you you're familiar with what i'm referring to um the second thing is i've been asking for over a year on pelham parkway by stillwell over the amtrak um over the amtrak Bridge area right before it becomes a grassy median again. Um, there are no lines, no yellow lines, no white lines. I keep on getting, oh, you got to wait till the warmer weather. Oh, this, oh, that. It's um, over a year now. On Pelham Parkway, it's before uh, DDC's a- area. It's not their zone, it's before the traffic lights. It's uh, over the Amtrak, going towards the Hutch, going towards the I-95. So it's not the DDC area. Right, but there's a median there, so. No, no, no. There's, there's. I, I will also send that picture to you too, so Perfect. you know what I'm talking about. There's Great. no long, There's no white lines. It's three. It's three lanes both directions. There's no white lines and no yellow line. Great. Send it over to me. Okay. Um, I'll look at it. Duly noted. The, 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 um, one of the one of the other ones. I'm not sure if it if it would still fall under uh, DDC or if it would be DOT. But also that area um, by Peace Plaza Esplanade. It is not. It's not paved, um, and nobody seems to be getting around to that. And that's also going on about a year. That's not paved, and it's Peace Plaza is on Pelham Parkway. It's on Esplanade between Pelham Parkway Main Road and Pelham Parkway Service Road. Yes, it's DDC. Okay. Okay. And, the- and is there any way in in how would somebody go about? I mean, granted, I know in uh, July uh, they're changing back the alternate side of the street. But this this little experiment of the hiatus of the alternate side has shown in some areas we can do one day one side, one day the other. We don't need two and two. So how do we they go have nothing to do, Debbie. Cleaning? I gotta interrupt you. They have nothing to do about cleaning. That's sanitation. They just put the sign. Okay, that okay, and, that and, would be and sanitation. We, and we and we pushing for more. Actually, if it be three days, will be even better. With the garbage and, 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 and the masks and all that crap that is on the street, I rather than doing even three times a, uh, a week. So, okay, uh, let's continue. Next speaker, please. Continue. Roxanne. Roxanne goes next. That I know for sure. It's all yours, Roxanne. Yes, I'd just like to say I'm not paying at all to be here. And it seems like these meetings go so long and public really doesn't have much time to ask questions. But I'd just like to make one question, please. Uh, regarding the final proposed plan presented to to CAB, CAB, does that mean there will be no public hearing right. so the community will have Thanks input? Because it seems like these entities anything. are created to circumvent the community. And my second question is the one way Wirelander, is that yeah, go ahead? Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Yeah, the second one. Sorry, um, in terms, as you said Rhinelander, could you explain that? I, I'm not sure I heard you properly. Well, the first question has nothing was to do with this project, the, Sarah. It has nothing to do okay. with this project. The question was regarding just, this project. It has nothing to do with this project. It's summer, just, uh, that the final proposed plan will be presented crazy. to CAB. Does that mean there will be no public hearing for the community to have input on this final proposed plan? 
So it's it's really it's a challenge in terms of the timing because we really want to implement this project this year, um, but the community boards don't meet during the summer. And if we if we wait till the next community board meeting uh, in September, um, th then we won't be able to implement this year because by sometime in October it becomes too cold to put the markings down. Now, uh, CB all, all the CB leadership is on the. Um, is on the cab, so the CBs will see this, including CB11. Um, if the you know if there is demand, uh, you know if the CBs want want this to be presented to the public, we are happy to set up additional meetings if need be. Um, it's just really a matter of we would need to get them in um, during the summer. But but yeah. this is but to answer what you're saying directly, this is not an attempt to circumvent any process. We really want to make sure we're doing this right, and we want to do so in in with the most outreach we can do. Um, it just becomes a challenge with with the scheduling, but we're always happy to do more outreach if we if, uh, if that's but, requested. But your agency can still hold a public hearing regardless if community board is in session or not. I mean, there's many venues to hold public hearings. Why couldn't that be an option? Sure, sure. I mean, it certainly could be, um, and we can continue that conversation. Um, I think I think if you'd like to request that through the CB um or through an elected official, that might be a better way to kind of organize that. But we're definitely very open to that. <laughs> We've done yeah, it before, we, we can certainly do it here. Excuse me, I might have to reach out to our elected. And my second question, please, regarding the, uh, it's, not, it's not related to this project, but it's a follow-up, maybe the chair will answer. Has the one-way Rylander been, uh, has Community Board 11 approved the one-way um, street for Rylander and White Plains Road? Hello? Yeah, we hear you. I don't think it's approved yet, unless Chris wants to overrule me on that. Nothing has been approved. We've got to we okay. got to bring it. We got to bring it at uh, the full board. Okay. Well, that means that again, this should have been done through a committee because uh, initially the vote was to have just a study, and now you're going to pass through a quick motion to pass it through. To, so uh, let's do it like this, Rabbi. Put it into the vote. Since the study was done, and you you've been present, everybody knows that the uh, Rhinelander study was uh, the study was done by DOT was pro the fact that it can be one way and it helps a lot. Put it into the motion, please, Rabbi. Well, well then let me put a comment there because public should have input before a motion is done. No, no, no. What, 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 hold on. Study was done. You wanted us to, to approve it or not. That's what we're going to do. Yeah, but there should be public input before the community makes a, a motion to approve it. Okay, let me hear what you want to say. You're a pro, you're against it. Well, I know for a fact that DOT email said that it was feasible, but not necessary, and that issue has been an issue because of double parking on White Plains Road, Rhineland. Not just myself, but several residents, drivers, and non-drivers have mentioned that the issue has ongoing issue with the double parking and the lack of enforcement over there, and that why turn the street to a one way when it's going to just bring more double parking? That's my objection to the one way Rhinelander. Okay. Uh, and also, that, uh, can I just interrupt have, one moment? One second, one second. We should have had a public hearing. On this, we have a public hearing on on the study for it, but we didn't have a public hearing where it should be uh, turning into on one way. So you're trying to tell me everything that's going to happen got to be public hearing? I'm sorry for that. It doesn't work that way. No, it doesn't work that way in Committee Board 11, but it could work that way. No, no, it doesn't so, work at all that way because for everything that's going to happen, you're going to have a public hearing. First, Van Nest was pro, which is the area that covers that area. I mean, which is the organization that covers that area. No, the ORC the, was not the, for it. It was the uh, the Bernadette who spoke on her behalf, but the fan nest did not vote for it. Hold on just a second. My I just want to ask if anybody else has any more questions regarding the Gun Hill project. So no, que no questions for the Gun Hill project. Okay, so with that being said, I, right, Sarah and Senna, thank you so much. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> have a good, have a good night. No, no, no. And if anybody has night. questions, of course, they can, you know, send them to us. Did and Keith we'll leave already? On. I'll stay on. Yeah, no, we'll stay on, but, you know. But I just All want right. the project Thank manager you, to go. If she doesn't have to, if she doesn't, Sarah and Senna don't have Thank to stick around and listen for this other stuff. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much, guys. We really appreciate it again. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, you too. And thanks again for your patience. It really means a lot. No problem. How's your blood pressure, Sarah, after not trying getting on? <laughs> You can probably tell it's a little high, but it's gotten lower over the course of the presentation. Okay. <laughs> I just don't want to keep folks on too late, but thank okay, you. Okay, good job. Take good care. job, Sarah. Good right. job. Thank you, Sarah and Senna. Rabbi. Yes, sir. Based on, on what we got from DOT, 
their their presentations they did on one way based also on the community which uh when i say the community is vanast area it's uh um, the the 200 or more signatures that we got about that area over there for them to turn it into uh, businesses that we heard that they're they're in the area why i see ken he's raising his hand go ahead ken just one second I'm, I'll, I'll give you the word can a motion be done so after the motion we do we can bring it out of the full board and uh, it's up to the full board after that to decide yes but the, the data was never provided they said what they did but when i asked for the data they, the uh the intern commissioner asked me to follow it and i haven't still received that information the actual data collected they said what data they collect but they didn't give me the numbers itself so i'm still waiting for that so that's unfair to go ahead with this uh chris, chris for my under from my understanding, the community very much wants it, and DOT know, David, says it's David. doable. Right. The there was only three people at the public hearing too, just for a feasible study, so you can't really say the community wants it. Three people, and that was Yahe, uh, Bernadette, and Bob Nolan, besides myself, and I was against it. Yeah, but there was also a whole bunch of signatures. Yeah, that but is the community too. You against it, if you want me. It's very easy to get signatures. It's not that. It doesn't mean... If you want to pick 201 signatures against Also, it, yeah. to my understanding, Roxanne, there were businesses in the area that they voted yes. There was what? Businesses in the area that they would like that uh, that street to turn into a one-way street. Yeah, it was initiated by Oasis. I know. And then you say... You it doesn't matter who, who initiated. Now, let's not start who initiated who doesn't initiate. Listen, Come on, I'm Roxanne, just dealing please. with details. You make I'm, talking about, I'm talking about businesses. I mean, because you keep doing this thing in every meeting. No, let's, I'm not. Okay, okay. okay. Don't make me mute you. Don't make me mute you. Don't make me mute you. Why are you being interrupting me? I'm saying that even don't the chair said didn't think the business could initiate on, that. You asked two questions, didn't you? Commissioner, can we have the data, please? So we can send it to the public so at least can be aware of what's going on in that one way street. We'll appreciate that. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Let's table it for today, Rabbi. And as soon as we get the data, I'm going to forward it to the public. Ken, go ahead. What does Kenny want to say? Yeah, Commissioner, yeah, Ken, go ahead. This is not on this issue, but I have actually two, two or three small issues that possibly can actually be done. Number one, on a lot of places where you have the don't walk sign, we have the walk sign before the red light changes, can you put up? A delay green, a little delay green sign. Many times drivers look at the walk sign, start going, and then realize it. Put up a delay green sign on all of these lights. It's not expensive, and it'll and it'll stop, and it may stop a few of the accidents and 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 traffic and also the people starting to go before the light turns green for that driver. You can also that would also be on the where those where the walk signs do this. And also on Pelham Parkway and Williamsbridge Road could also have delayed green signs. Many times you go there because it's a weird, it's a, it's not what it, it, it's, a, it's a, in a sense, it's a three way light se sequence. You, you, many times the, the driver's stay on Williamsbridge Road think it's supposed to be going green when it's the other, when, when it's the other side of Pelham Parkway that's now going uh, usually westbound. Number two, on Stillwell Avenue, can you get a right turn sign on that red light that used to be there? Uh, that that stop, Kenny, that was stopped by a previous community board. I don't have the slightest reason, Mr. Commissioner, why it was stopped. It's to me, uh, it's right on red. I don't... Right on red at St on Pelham Parkway and Stillwell Avenue where there's a right turn by the, by, for the bus stop. Number three, this is another question. Can we possibly get a, on Pell Parkway and Boston Road, can you get a staggered light system so that the people coming off the Bronx River Parkway will be able to go the same way they do it by Allerton Avenue? And that's my, those are my requests and I thank you for, what do you think about the delay green sign, which I think is the easiest one? Um, if you have specific intersections, you mentioned Pelham Parkway and Williamsbridge Road. If you guys want us to That's, take a look and see if I'm we talking can about all of the intersections where you have the white, the the the. We, the every the, intersection has that now. It's what? leaving pedestrian intervals. All the signals will have that. 
No, it's not on every intersection. It it's, will not be. A, it's not it going will be. every intersection. It will be. As the signals are upgraded, they will be all LPI. And maybe we can have a delayed green sign on every one of them because people, the drivers, look at the walk signs. I mean, if you have a sp- like I said, I'll look at Pelham Parkway and Williamsbridge Road to see if it's if if there's an issue there, and we can if so, there is an issue, we can certainly take a look at putting in those signs. Okay, where where how do I email you to get you the to get you the other intersections? Uh, my email address is k k a l b at d o t dot n y c dot g o v. K k a l b d o t at d o t. Dot NYC. Dot NYC. Dot NYC. Yep. It, Holly just put it in the uh, in the group in the chat. But yes. First initial, last name, K K A L B, at D O T. N Y C. G O V. Thank you. No problem. Hey, anybody else have any yes. final comments? Yes. Uh, Keith, you mentioned Bob. the it, Pelham Parkway between. Uh, Boston Road and White Plains Road. You mentioned that DDC was working there. Well, they put in 48-inch water pipes two years ago and just paved over it, and it's a mess. It's been a mess for two years. I've complained to the community board for two years. Uh, All of a sudden, our Pelham Parkway task force meetings were stopped a year ago. Uh, It's a minefield over there, and I'm surprised you don't have control over the street over there. Well, also, it's, under, it's under the Department of Design and Constructions. Uh, it's within they, the limits of their project. So we don't resurface roadways that are inside project yeah, but limits. Are you aware that they took the five lanes that was over there, moved the hydrants out eat lane on each side and cut it down to three lanes, and you'll have a bus stop there, which will cut it down to two lanes during rush hour? Um, I've seen the plans for Pelham Parkway. I'm familiar with them, and so is the board. Uh, they've reviewed all the all the plans the for the board project. reviewed it. The board did, of course. It wasn't shown to the public. Sure, it was. No, it wasn't. I never saw it. I was on that Pelham Parkway task force until they ended it. The project, just like we just showed this project for uh, for Gun Hill, we we showed all the project improvements before the project went out for bid. No, they weren't because they were changed. Uh-huh. Okay, just like when the 36-inch pipe from Con Ed came right through the bus, right through Pelham Parkway. Right. Not before they reconstructed the parkway, but after the parkway was reconstructed. So you have a six-foot gap by Bronxwood Avenue where there's a dip in the road on both sides of Pelham Parkway. Okay, so you had a brand-new reconstructed yep. parkway that DDC... Put the parkway in, and then Con Ed came and put a six-foot gash right through it. Yep. And in another year or two, you're going to have a problem there over there because there's no concrete foundation. It's only dirt. I'm just letting you know that, too. There is concrete foundation under Pelham Parkway now. Right, but not where Con Ed came through with six feet to put their pipe in. Yeah, they, they were required to restore the concrete. They didn't. Check it. You'll see. All right, thank you, Keith. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Robert. Uh, one second, Rob. I'm just very concerned how DOT just doesn't want to provide the community uh, the data and the plans and doesn't want to work directly with community board. It's just like circumventing the community, and that's not right. So I'm going to file another complaint. Thank you. Thank you, Roxanne. Okay, any other final questions or comments? Okay, we thank the commissioner, we thank Holly, we thank everybody else. Who joined us today? I've had data for months and nothing. For months we've had data. Okay, I will make a motion to adjourn for my committee, seconded by anybody. Have a great summer. Okay. Good night, everybody. Okay. Thank okay, you, good everybody. Night. Have have a great evening. Thanks for joining us. Good night, everybody. See you in another good month, night. hopefully. Take care. Bye bye. Good night, everybody. <laughs>